This is John of the Everyday Fan. Tonight I have the pleasure of being on the beat with former ECW owner Todd Gordon. How are you, sir? My pleasure, John. Great to be here. Now, I'm very glad to have you. you got a lot of things to talk about. Uh, first of all, your book, but we will get to the book later. Um, the questions I have are probably might be in the book, but let's let's start and see where we go. <laughs> you were a successful businessman. What made you get into wrestling, to owning a wrestling company? Uh, it was really a freak thing. I, I was just in love with wrestling since I was a kid, growing up in the, the WWF, you know, the Bruno San Martino, Killer Kowalski, you know, that era. Uh, I heard it one day on the radio, a guy had a wrestling show on the radio, on mainstream radio, which was for that time unheard of. You know, you never, people didn't acknowledge wrestling existed, basically. And I listened in and I got, got to know the guy. I got involved with him a little bit. He had an own wrestling deal going. And unfortunately, he went bankrupt. And after it was over, his ring announcer, his music man, sound guy, his one of his wrestlers, they all approached me and said, would you get a license just to keep this going just locally? He said, once a month, I might spit sports bar. And that's all. It's just like, you know, 80, 100 people. I'll work for free. I'll work for free. We just want to keep it going. So I got a license. I said, what the hell? So it was a hobby. Did not expect two years later to be on pay-per-view. I can, t- I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I mean, that was... It was like a snowball rolling down a hill that just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was, it was unstoppable. It was like a bigger force than anyone could stop it. It was crazy. We got we lucked into a TV deal where someone was starting a new uh, sports station here in Philadelphia. The station was going to cover the Phillies games, the Eagles, I mean, Flyers games, the Sixers games. But they had no programming. And the guy who started that network said the guy who was our, one, our video guy, filming bar shows and selling three tapes. He said, can you, do you have any idea, any ideas for programming? He said, how about wrestling? He said, can you give me wrestling? He said, I get you a pilot. The guy says, get me the pilot. He came and said, we got to make a pilot. I said, a pilot? What For what? <laughs> they want to put us, they want to put us on TV. I go, we're running bar shows in front of you. What? Well, long story short, uh, we got this kids association. We filled this building up with people and we did a pilot. And he said, done, you're on. The pilot looked nothing like the show ended up looking like. I mean, the pilot was a bunch of young kids cheering for the baby faces, booing the heels. And, uh, you know, obviously after that, we took it to a whole different level. Well, it started as uh, Tri-State Wrestling Alliance. It morphed into Eastern Championship Wrestling, and then it morphed into Extreme Championship Wrestling. So, yes. w- go ahead. That's convenient. We don't have to change the initials. And yeah, it's changing change the, the merchandise there. So and the bath towels. When, when, you, when you seceded from the NWA, did you have any second thoughts about doing that? Oh, my gosh, no. It was what springboarded us into a national level, actually. Uh, we were regional by calling ourselves Eastern. Uh, when we went with the NWA Eastern, the NWA was basically a defunct organization. They had like four or five members that really weren't running many shows. Uh, but the name still had a small amount of cachet. And Eddie Gilbert, my booker at the time, talked me into doing that. We joined the NWA. Uh, but there was no value to it, to be honest with you. Uh, Jim Crockett, one of the members of the NWA, came to me and said, you're the only member who has television. We want to we want to do something. We need to have a champion that travels, you know, tag champions. I'm in Texas, but you have TV. You can name a champion, make a champion, and you know, keep them, and we'll just get tag team. Cha- you know, we'll do other things in our territories, but it'll elevate us by being on your TV. Sad, I thought about it. I said, okay, I'll do that. Somewhere along the way, after he asked me, one of the other uh, NWA promoters, Dennis Carluzzo, started barking, carrying on, and no way is not going to happen. He was making such a ruckus and stink in both the sheets and the press where he could. I said, I didn't come to you guys. <laughs> I assumed Crockett spoke for the whole group and all four of you. I said, you know, I didn't come to you and ask to put his tournament on. You guys came to me. I would never have done it. I just kept doing what I'm doing. And this guy, to be honest with you, had been a thorn in our side for quite a while. He was a local promoter from Jersey. Who, Quite honestly, if he just spent 10% of his energy that he put into our demise in his own company, he might have built it into something but he was obsessed with our success and he did anything he could to put us, you know, out of business. He would call a fire marshal at every show. 
better go count heads. I think they have more people there than Billy's Laos. Um, send tapes out ahead of time that Billy's were getting ready to run. Uh, so this, this is what we bring to your town. Look like what they do. There's violence, they're wrecking it. It's terrible. There's blood and gut. And so people start canceling shows. I mean, it was a nonstop barrage with this guy. And that was pretty much the last straw. So it just worked out well that that was a, a forum for us to do that, throwing away the NWA title and springboarding into extreme, which was, again, was an art now we, we consider to be a world championship. Now, you, you know, you talked about being a fan of the, the old WWF, Bruno San Martino and all that. You um, you were in the NWA briefly. You seem like kind of an old school kind of guy. And then extreme championship wrestling is sort of, well, not sort of, it is a whole new breed. How did you, what led you to, to accept that, to, to take that different step? Well, I mean, I'm old school, no doubt about it, but I'm also, I think, to think relevant at any age, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, when we first started the whole thing, the idea was I wanted to put on the shows that I would like to see. I was sick of the crap on TV. I was sick of the cartoons in the WWF. And they actually had a cartoon show in the WWF. I mean, it was it was just enough yeah. for it. I it had I'd lost all believability. Growing up, I had, as a kid, I believed I believe what I saw. I wanted to get that back. I want to give back back to the fans. I mean, our first major show, the main event, had Stan Hansen, Abdul the Butcher, Kevin Sullivan, and Terry Funk in it. Oh. That's the match I wanted to see. Yeah. And I knew the people that stand behind, behind me, they wanted to see it too. And I could have been in the stands enjoying it, but it turns out I was the one putting the match on. And I just stuck with that philosophy. I, what I want to see, they're going to want to see it. We were a hardcore city, hardcore, in a blue-collar town. And then Paul came in and added a whole new element by having his finger on the pulse of what was happening now with the music, the grunge music, the public enemies music, Jason Saban, anything that was at that time popular, relevant, he brought in as their music. He was what actually said to me, let's change the title name to Extreme. Like we always had the idea of Shane throwing the belt down, but I hadn't thought of a name change. And uh, he said, let's go with Extreme. And I said, eh, you know, I don't know. He goes, you listen to me in two years. That's all you're going to hear. Extreme sports, extreme skiing. Extreme. Just, I'm telling you, it's the next big thing. How he knew that, I don't know. But he was right. And we were in there. We slid in there first. And our product was indeed extreme. I mean, we were the Howard Stern of wrestling. We were R-rated wrestling. People had never done that before, let alone on TV. Because they just didn't watch our show. The guys who ran the network, they were so happy with programming. They put us on at dinner time. We're on Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock with an audience screaming that as clear as can be across the TV, either show your tits or you fucked up, whatever it was, you could hear it. My, my kids were here at the dining room table. I'm like, oh, yikes. And they never watched the show. <laughs> so they let us run. So when you, you ultimately ended up leaving uh, ECW, what led to your decision on that? Well, that's you know, a long story. Uh, in 95, we had, the funds had kind of dried up. And uh, I made a deal with Paul where I let him basically take over the company at that point and fund it with his family. And I still stayed on because I wanted to make sure that, A, the deals would stay in place. I mean, I was the guy with the deals with the guy in Japan. And doing the, you know, it's not easy for those guys to say, oh, now talk to him. And so. Okay. It's important that I stay on to keep the company afloat. Uh, also, I, you know, there was debt involved, and I wanted to get my money back. So for me, I want to stay there and make sure things ran right and do my best as I could, even though I wasn't the, the money guy at that point after years of being so. You know, I want to make sure things were cool so I got my money back. And then by 97, it, was, it just got out of control. Uh, the rest of the rest of the, you know, the Dressing room was fractured, and it had been a real family dressing room like for the whole time. Biggest family ever saw, and things were now fractured and they were splintering off. Guys were unhappy; they wanted to jump ship, and uh, there was a lot going on between Paul and I. I don't give away too much of the book; it's a lot right. of the, the hook to the book. But I ended up saying in '97, "Yeah, I'm I'm going." And you had enough? No. So I mean, if I, had, if I had a regret, there'd be two. One, 
that the internet had come along five years sooner. If we could have sold our, you know, our monthly arena shows on the internet for five, ten, whatever dollars a piece around the country, we wouldn't have needed the money in, involved in pay per view, the losses for pay per view. Yeah. Uh, we would have been solvent right away. People would have, they, they were, couldn't get enough of our tapes. But imagine if they could have watched it live for like a nominal fee. But the internet wasn't there yet. Well, the only, only thing wrestling on the internet was Prodigy chat room. I mean, that was it. There was right. no, nothing about wrestling at all, which now, of course, everybody's on the internet. But at the time, we had lightning in a bottle. So we were there to, you know, could have grabbed it. But that was, that was one thing. The other grip probably would be <clears throat> that we tried to run too fast before we got really comfortable walking. We started buying TV time in New York on MSG, TV time in Florida on the Sunshine Network. And those expenses were not being, we weren't able to catch up with those expenses. We expected to bring in advertising to cover those expenses, but that didn't work out the way we had planned. And we were all like, you know, working our fingers to the bone day and night 24 7. It was no, it was no joke how hard we worked to get where we did. Just the fact that people are still yelling out 25, 30 years later at shows, ECW. I mean, that's amazing to me. It's home, I mean, this is a bar show. And here it is 30 years later. And people are still yelling those initials. That's an incredibly humbling and amazing thing to me. Well, you just answered my next question. I was going to say, 30 years later, the, the, the little baby that you created, people are chanting that in, in independent scenes on the WWE, all over the place, they're still chanting for ECW. That's got to be a tremendous source of pride. Absolutely. I mean, my gosh, it was only about a month or so ago, Raw was here in Philly. Paul walked out to the ring to open the show. And 20,000 people started yelling ECW, ECW. It's mind-boggling to me. Amazing. I mean, WCW tried to imitate us. They had Wildcat Willie, WCW, <laughs> who'd run around ringside trying to get people to go, WC. I mean, every, <laughs> every, everybody wanted that, but it was a natural thing. We didn't pr- promote it. They did. The fans did that. The fans were as much a part of my promotion as we were. But honest to God, they, from the bringing the weapons to the show to hand the wrestlers, to standing back until the wrestlers went through the crowd. We made sure the back row was as good a seat as the front row because they went everywhere. The fans respected it because they saw these guys were beating the hell out of each other for okay. real as they went through the audience. The audience was not going to get involved either. They hit them on the back. You know, it wasn't like that. These guys were real hardcore. You know, they were beating each other good. Our locker room was like a mass unit after a show. And uh, it was real. All of a sudden, people believed again. It was all I ever wanted from the beginning. Had I known it was going like this 30 years later, I don't know how, if I'd done anything differently. I just, I'm happy, I'm shocked, I'm humbled, I'm amazed. And it gave me the opportunity to write a book that's doing really well. I just have a couple more questions before I talk to you about your book. I, sure. I heard yeah, I heard in an interview you said one maybe the only guy or one of the only guys that you really tried to get in ECW was Rowdy Roddy Piper, one of my all-time favorites. Did you have a plan for him if he came in or or this that was really early on. That was pre-TV. That was when I was only bringing like one star at a time. And started with Ivan Koloff, then Jimmy Snuka became my first champion. Uh then we brought him Morocco, so we had re re uh, reinvigorated the Stuka Morocco feud. It wasn't that long ago on TV. And the natural next step for Jimmy as our champion was Roddy, who was no longer was under contract for anybody either. Okay. So I reached out to Roddy, you know, and I said, uh, hey, I got going on here in Philly. Love to bring in again, there's no TV, there's no Booker, no Eddie, no Paul, none of them were there yet. And he said, hey, you got two really good minds in Snooker Morocco. And, you know, by the way, they both had uh, wives who were something in the uh, airplane in, uh, airline industry. So they were coming in for no charge. Rock was flying from, from Hawaii, Jimmy from Utah, which would have been hardly eat them in a lot, a lot of money for his tickets. Sure. I didn't pay, I, I paid nothing for them. So Roddy said, Hey, listen, I don't have a wife in the airline industry. <laughs> I'm coming from Portland and I'm not riding coach. So if you want me, I, I don't think you can afford me. I mean, 
Whatever you're drawing, you need a lot more than that for me to know. To be able to pay me what I want and the kind of accommodations I want, et cetera, et cetera. But I tell you, you got two great guys there. Ride them. And thanks for your offer. So that's the only person I ever wanted to get in that I didn't get in. And years later, he wasn't really able to come in. Right, right. So, and so we didn't reach out a second time. But yeah, that was the only one. But hey, oh. guess what? I had Terry Funk. Oh. To me, the, the, the literally the living legend, Terry Funk. He wrote the foreword to my book. That touches me so much. That's not something Terry does. That meant a lot to me. And he was he was my guy. I mean, without him, no one would ever heard of Shane Douglas. Without him, no one ever heard of Sabu. Without him, no one heard of Public Enemy. He, his fuse with those three early, early on in ECW elevated all three of them to main event status. And who could, how can you not be grateful for a guy like that? Who's so generous, so giving, so so wonderful a guy. Well, let's talk about your book, Todd is God. When, how, why did you decide to put that out now? Well, first, we just say for those who are not aware of it, that's not like a religious t- title or anything. No, no. It was it was a chant that our fans did. Reno would yell out when I would come out to the ring. They would Todd is God. Todd is God. So that's where we came up with the title. Um. Why now? Because I had a guy named Sean who I met through Kayfabe commentaries, Sean Oliver, who did these tr- terrific DVDs and a great business going. I did two of them with him. We got along great. After it was over, we talk on the phone occasionally. I said, go, oh, that reminds me of the time Sandman, blah, 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 blah. He goes, oh, my God. That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. My- You've got to write a book. I said, I'm not writing a book. Oh, got to write a book. I'm not writing a book. He said, what about this? Is that really happened? I said, no, it's not what really happened. He goes, but it's out there on the Rise and Fall DVD. It's out there on the, all these unauthorized story of ECW. The unauthorized, well, guess what? It really was time to do the authorized story. I mean, I was there. No one ever interviewed me with WWE versions of the tapes or the yeah. books. Not one book, not one DVD to interview for, or Shane. Or Joey Styles, but more importantly, I, mean, I was there. For, I knew every business act, every little skeleton, every little came. From, I was there. He said, "Let's tell the authorized story. Let's get the real story out there. People would want to hear that." No, no, no. Then finally, it's the pandemic, and the, we ended up what the hell? And we spent about six, eight hours a week, for like six or eight months, with me on Zoom. Me just telling stories. Tell me about so and so, and I would, or tell me about the night the line was crossed. Whatever he would ask me, and I would just go on and on and on for like an hour. And he would then have the Herculean task of going back to the tapes and trying to put them in some kind of a chronological order. Because I would just grab them, you know, as they came in my head, I just spit them out. And uh, he did a great job of that. By the way, he did a, he did a phenomenal job with the book. There's so much on the cutting room floor still, but yet. We put a we packed a lot in there. There's a lot of funny, a lot of not so funny. There's a lot of drug stories, sex stories, rock and roll story. I mean, it's all in there, and it's a, it's a good read. And did you get a lot of help from other from the wrestlers that were there? Did you get input from them, or is it no, more just no. yours? No, nobody knew I was even doing it until I was ready to put it out. Well, my closest friends did Sam and Fonzie. Uh, Two Cold Scorpio. I mean, these are my those three were like my my crew that we ran everywhere with. We traveled all over the country, the four of us together. And at the very beginning, Nancy Sullivan also, and then eventually just the four of us. Was it a lot of fun writing it, putting it all together, reliving it? <clears throat> Most of it was. You know, I sat there. You know, when out of nowhere, I'm going, "Oh my God!" I just remembered the time in Pittsburgh, and show and say, "What time in Pittsburgh?" I go, at like nine in the morning, we had an early morning flight. The four of us are together, and all of a sudden, we can't find Fonzie. And Scorpio goes, he was just here. I, I don't know. <laughs> and Sam, none of us can find him. Now the bags are coming down the conveyor belt. It's going around in a circle. And all of a sudden, there's Fonzie sound asleep on the conveyor belt. Oh, as the okay. luggage is coming down and smacking him in the head. And it's one of those kind of stories that I just out of nowhere, like something reminded me of it. And there are like a thousand stories like that, especially the Sam and one story, which really are the best stories in the book. He's well, nuts. So before I let you go, now the important part. How can people get the book? How can people get information about the book? I mean, they can go on Amazon. 
they can go in, in any bookstore. They can go to simonandschuster.com, barnesandnoble.com. Uh, pretty much anywhere books are sold, it's available. And like I said, it jumped out of the gate really hot, and I'm really hoping that people the, – all the feedback I've gotten so far has been one of the better reads I've had. It's like As a wrestling book, it's a really good read. I couldn't put it down. Just, each story got better than the one before it. And there's espionage and intrigue at the end with Paul and I, and there's like I said, all kind, there's a little bit of everything. Like our shows. Our shows were not just violence. They are also comedy. They were also ch- great wrestling. And Guerrero, Malenko, uh, Ray Mysterio. Oh. I mean, all oh, of that. Yeah. So we gave him something for, and I think the book does the same thing. It has something for everybody. Well, I will be ordering it in about 10 minutes. I'll be going back <laughs> online and ordering it because I wanted it. I wish I would have had it before the interview, but I wanted to take the chance to, to grab your interview when I absolutely could. But I will be ordering the book because, you know, like you said, 30 years past it, people are still talking about it. People are still the, the great matches, the great storylines, the great wrestlers, people, Terry Funk, et cetera, et cetera. I'm so, grateful, but and I'm humbled. Well, it's, it's, it all started with you, sir. So, so before I let you go, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for ECW. Thank you for a lot of great wrestling memories. And I encourage everybody to check out the book. Todd has got to check it out on Amazon. Check it out at your local bookseller. And buy the book. It's going to be amazing for any wrestling fan. As I said before, I thank you for reaching out. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Todd, thank you very much. You have a great day, sir. You too. Thanks.